Is it actually just gonna be making him make him smile, him feel good? Yeah. All right. So, when the French adopted the Berthier, <laughs> the whole reason that they did. <laughs> I think I may have killed him. <laughs> All right. All right. So, All right. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am joined today by Mr. Miles Francis. Because not that long ago, I went ahead and took a TCCC course from you. I was looking to get a little more medical education, uh, first aid education, something a little beyond the typical like first aid CPR kind mm -hmm. of thing. And uh, we got hooked up with you, and you do. Well, first off, what does TCCC stand for? So Tactical Combat Casualty Care was originally a research project. Uh, it was started in Naval Special Warfare and then kind of uh, got brought out into the rest of the special operations community and then trickled down into the conventional military uh, at the end of the 90s into the early 2000s. And um, what originally was meant by that project, or its purpose, I should say, is that they were looking at preventable death on the battlefield. Um, and that has now kind of come full circle uh, through that research project, they identified the three main killers, which are uncontrolled extremity hemorrhage, uh, compromise of the airway, and attention pneumothorax. Uh, and the military then looked at, here's the three things that are killing us. We need to develop a simple-to-use skill set and some equipment specifically designed to treat these injuries. And then that's kind of where this all started. So, um, And it's now come full circle in the civilian sector. All of those lessons that we learned in the military... Um, are now being incorporated into civilian trauma education. What I find really interesting about this is, in some ways, from like the Civil War through Vietnam, there wasn't a lot of change in medical care. In some ways, there was a lot. Like by right. Vietnam, wounds were a lot more survivable because it was a lot quicker to get guys to the hospital. Like we had helicopter evacuation. Mm -hmm. If you could survive an hour, maybe less, maybe a little more, Helicopter comes in, they load you up, boom, back to the base, you're in a hospital, and you've got like total trauma care surgical treatment facilities. Correct. In World War I, it's going to take you a lot longer to get back to a, a significant hospital. The difference, though, is, as I understand it, was in the survivability of can you last long enough for the evacuation to get there? Like in the Civil War, if you couldn't last half an hour, didn't matter. It was going to take you a day to get to a hospital. In World War I, it was going to take you a day to get to a hospital. By Vietnam, okay, you're an hour away from a helicopter, but what if you can't make it an hour? And that didn't change really until, well, TCCC became fully embedded in, in military doctrine. Right. And even in the Korean War, that was like the infancy of, of helicopter-based medical evacuation really kind of came into its own in the Vietnam War, as you were saying. Um, even going so far as how far it's advanced now, when I was in Iraq, I mean, there were usually four to six Blackhawks just circling the city uh, in any wow. given day. Um, so you, as long as you could survive to the helicopter, and that's where TCCC plugged that gap. They said, what are the tools and techniques that we need to be teaching every single soldier, sailor, airman, marine, to get you to survive long enough to get flown to a surgeon? I guess where this applies to day-to-day -day civilian medicine mm -hmm. is, okay, there's a 15-car pileup behind a semi-truck on the freeway. Anyone who can survive until the ambulances get there is probably going to be okay. They're going to get to a hospital. But what are the things that you can do if you're a responder before the first responders? What can you do to save a life for someone who might not be able to survive until an ambulance gets there otherwise? Correct. And, and the same three things that were identified in combat trauma are mirrored in civilian trauma. Obviously, there's different mechanisms behind those injuries. You know, in, in the military, we see a lot of blast injuries and penetrating trauma from bullets and stab wounds and shrapnel injuries. We do see some gunshots here on the civilian side, but nowhere near as much as the military does. But there are industrial accidents. There's farming accidents. There's, as you mentioned, car accidents where you're just as likely to need to know how to apply a tourniquet or pack a wound or put a chest seal on or any of the other things that we teach in this class. Yeah. So the three main components, as I came away discovering, were, I think you already said these, uh, a lot of bleeding, mm -hmm. especially on an extremity, and uh, loss of airway, mm -hmm. which is like your 
tongue plugs your throat, you can't breathe, and you die of asphyxiation. Easiest way to explain that, yeah. Or tension pneumothorax. So you went over the percentages in class, and it was like 90% of, of the preventable deaths found in, in retroactive combat studies were mm. just bleeding. A small percentage of them were tension pneumothorax. What the heck is tension pneumothorax? Right, and there were a bunch of studies that all pretty much mirrored themselves, but a tension pneumothorax... The easiest way to describe that without getting too sciencey here is air that builds up between the wall of the chest and the lung. So our, our lungs expand and contract as we breathe. Mm -hmm. They fill it with air, gas exchange happens. We breathe in, get oxygen, breathe out, CO2 leaves the body. But if air builds up between that chest wall and the lung, and the lung is then compressed and is no longer able to inflate as effectively, you're no longer able to oxygenate effectively. You are building up pressure in the chest. You're putting pressure on the heart. So now the heart has more trouble pushing blood forward into the body. The vessels that bring blood back into the heart, the vena cava, the big vein that goes through our chest, that gets compressed, brings less blood back to the heart. And you can very quickly start spiraling down. Uh, that injury can happen a number of ways. In combat trauma, it's usually some type of penetrating injury, like a gunshot to the chest or something like that. Um, but you can also have a closed chest injury, like a blast injury, or maybe you, somebody falls and lands on their chest. I've seen a tension pneumothorax from a car accident where a person was pulled forward and their chest hit their steering wheel, and it basically ruptured the lung and all that air spilled into the chest cavity. So even hmm. if the chest is closed, we call those a closed chest injury, hence the name, um, you, could still develop, yeah, <laughs> you could still develop a tension pneumothorax that way. So the vast majority, well, the significant majority mm -hmm. of these preventable injuries that have to be addressed before first responders appear are bleeding. Correct. And there's a pretty basic solution to especially extremity bleeding, which is what we spent a lot of time in this class doing. First learning how to do, and then doing in uh, surprisingly realistic exercises, which we'll get into in just a moment. Oh, but yeah. what is that solution? So obviously we want to keep the red stuff in the body, right? If we want to really break down emergency medicine and critical care in the simplest way possible, here it is. Air goes in and out and blood goes round and round and deviation from the standard is bad. So we need to find a way to keep that blood inside the body. So obviously direct pressure often will work, but for a major bleed, you're going to usually have to up the ante a little bit. And a tourniquet is going to be our first action, uh, first line of action for an extremity hemorrhage. Okay. And now what, what surprised me about this class, because I didn't really recognize what I was getting into, but it was awesome once we did, is you set up classes with basically live action volunteers playing injured people. Yep. And with f basically fake prosthetic injuries, all the way up to the point of having a blood, a fake blood pack and a little pump and the the injured person has a spurting, bleeding wound like an artery, and you have to attend to them and put on a tourniquet, and they don't stop spurting blood with the little pump until you've got that tourniquet applied Correct. correctly. All right, he's breathing heavy. He's starting to sweat. Okay. So it really was, this wasn't just classroom, you know, textbook sort of instruction. This was, okay, we've learned what the theory is. Now, here's a guy who's moaning in pain, lying on the ground, spurting blood. Fix it. Like, deal with it. And then the course got more intense from there, and it turned into, okay, well, there's, there's three of you. Now there's four people lying on the ground with all sorts of assorted different injuries. Fix them all. So oh, chest, that's chest seal. So we have to seal it. Okay. Yep. So you exhale really so good chest, when we tell you. Chest seal is preferable to gauze. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep. It's the only way that you can treat this. Yes. Yep. Okay. So. Because that holds bigger than your needles. Yeah. It's yep. perfect. This should stick nicely. Okay. Okay. Big, big inhale. And, and then, when she's ready. Okay, okay. Right, big go. exhale. Okay. Um, 
is doing better. Yeah. Pulse right. is better. Okay. Right. Breathing better. All right. And and it really was like we did three or four live, basically live action uh, exercises on the second day of this class. It was a two day class. First day was basically classroom mm -hmm. instruction. Second day was exercises, live exercises. And every one of those exercises upped the ante. It's like, okay, you figured out how to deal with one person. Now we're going to throw in these extra yep. surprises for you. Yeah, keys up above. All right. Do you have a clear. All right, I need. Oh, it's still, it's still spurting. I need another tourniquet. Where's my med bag? Med bag, over here. I need a second tourniquet. A tourniquet. Okay, you've, re -tight you've re tightened the tourniquet. He's still bleeding. Okay, you got it. Going for a wound pack. Okay. That one. So I got a secondary one. This looks like a through and through, so probably got a broken leg. Okay. Let's make sure that this is still set. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay. Is he still breathing okay? Still breathing okay. Okay, hemorrhage is now controlled. Okay. Okay. So, that's the... Go ahead and keep it. Talk to each other. Where are you at in your algorithm? Where are you? Okay. Yeah. So we did. For anyone who's watching who's ever been in the military, it's going to be no stranger to the term crawl, walk, run. And that's exactly how I approach all of my classes. You know, day one, predominantly classroom, a couple of videos, and some breakout labs where we practice, you know, wound packing and how to apply a tourniquet, how to manage chest injuries, airway management, basic skills, splinting. And then day two, you're correct. We start with a single casualty and then two casualties and then two casualties and one of them is very seriously injured and then it just progressively escalates throughout the afternoon and it, the purpose of it is to not only give you a mastery of those individual skills but to make sure that you understand the treatment pathway uh, and apply it appropriately. Yeah, if you, what I really like about this is it, I feel like it gave me the, the baseline skills for I roll up on an accident mm -hmm. where like the wheels are still spinning and the dust is still in the air, what do you do? Correct. Okay, well, here is this marché. Marché. So, learning French, for me, the, the uh, mnemonic is, it works, marché, <laughs> M-A-R-C-H-E. I'll give you that. So, <laughs> and, and what Ian is talking about is, basically it's the order of priorities in treatment and trauma. So M is massive hemorrhage, a is airway, R is respiratory, so when, you know, breathing, chest injuries. C is circulation, H is head injury, hypothermia. E kind of just covers everything else, burns and fractures and eye injuries and all that other good stuff. And then of course, evacuation Yeah. after that. So it's like, here's your, here's your procedure checklist mm -hmm. of what do you do when you find a, I don't know, maybe an unconscious person, maybe a, a person who's in shock in their car on the side of the highway, or if you're in the military, someone gets shot, or an IED goes off. What do you do to assess the people around that injury? So I, I had a great time. Um, to be clear, like I paid for the class, and I went into it with no plans to do any particular video, but I really enjoyed it, and I think it's really valuable information, in particular for people who are either shooting on a regular basis or carrying a pistol. Yep. If, if you're ever in an incident where a gun is discharged in public, you might or might not be the person who needs the gun, but there will definitely be someone there, much, well, much more likely to be someone there who needs emergency medical treatment. And if you can be the person to provide that treatment, wouldn't you want to be? And if you're out at the range, accidents happen. Like I've, I've been involved in that. I yes, have, a, have like, I've been the guy who was bleeding onto a shooting mat. Fortunately, it wasn't traumatic at all, but we didn't know that right at the beginning. Um, you know, you're about to spat. <laughs> all right, Deborah, I will get the top end here. Okay. His arm wound is spurting blood again. Okay, recheck the, the tourniquet. Tourniquet is good. He's still squirting blood. Okay, second tourniquet, second tourniquet. Second tourniquet. Okay, arm wound sling. Is there room for a second tourniquet above? Yeah. Uh, a full size door? No, there's no room above. I can put one below. Will it? 
Okay. No? I, I've got room between the, the first tourniquet and the wound. Okay, yep. then yep. let's do that. So this would be one of those cases where you do a second picture, yep. Did you put it on wrong? Yep. Okay. Don't worry, we can make this look really cool in post. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So where can people find you? What what do you offer? This was obviously something I took locally. What do you offer for people in the way of classes? All right, so classes are always evolving. Um, I've really kind of decided that I, I want to stay in my knowledge base, which is tactical and austere medicine. Uh, a couple of years ago when I started the company, I also did firearms classes. Um, but I'm, I'm really a lot more passionate about austere medicine. So right now we're offering the two-day TCCC class. Uh, next month I am launching my Medical 2 class, which covers... Um, the easiest way to explain it is, is primary care in a grid-down setting. So we cover things like dental emergencies and wound management and you know, how to diagnose certain maladies. If you've ever been in the military, the term sick call probably comes to mind. It's kind of a sick call course. Um, I offer a couple of other odds and ends. I'm working on a field craft course right now, a little uh, escape and evasion work. Um, and then on top of that, I also have a lot of products that I sell. If you check out the website, we have various sized kits from small kits up to full size trauma kits. Uh, we offer non-medical gear. I've got some cool clandestine toys on the website too. You do have to tell um, people what the website is. Of course, and the website is archangeldynamics.com. There we go. You can find me on Instagram at archangeldynamicsllc. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions, answer an email. Uh, definitely check the website out if you're local to Southern Arizona. Uh, we'd love to have you for a class. Uh, I'm also happy to travel as well for a class. And hey, if you're on the other side of the world, Stop the Bleed classes or TCCC classes are available fairly widely. Like, oh, absolutely. This, this isn't a really niche U.S. specific thing. So this is, this is, as I understand it, really the basis of current modern military combat medicine and also, as a result, the basis of a lot of emergency trauma medicine in the civilian world. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone that's ever taken a CPR class even in the last 10 years and has continued that education, has seen that change. We used to teach airway trumped everything, airway breathing circulation, and it was the same way in our trauma training, airway trumped pretty much everything. But that march pathway, we call it something a little bit differently in civilian medicine, but it's come full circle now. Um, and TCCC, as you said, is the basis of modern battlefield medicine. Every NATO country, their military goes through this course. There you go. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Yep. Um, I know it's not a gun video, but I think this is something that's really pretty darn applicable to uh, many of the people watching. So hopefully you take this and decide to go find a good class and educate yourself a bit more if you don't already know it. Hopefully you enjoyed the video either way. Thanks for watching. Try it first. Look on the bright side here. The last guy this happened to, we uh, slung his arm up and then remembered we had to bandage it. And perfect. <laughs> so you're in good oh, shape. Yeah. Do okay. not admit <laughs> things like that to the patient. Okay. <laughs> This is going to hurt. <laughs> At least you're through your transferred there you care. Go. There you go. Around.